McGill Space Institute bug. Uh, okay, I'm going to try to mix these up. you know after the talk we are going to be looking at Saturn through our telescopes which is usually pretty awesome to get to our telescopes you're going to go out these doors you're going to take the elevators all the way down to the ground floor and continue going out through the doors and we'll be in this grassy area near the ground floor doors okay thanks and for anyone who entered a floor above this I know this might feel like it's the ground floor, but uh, it's the fifth floor. Uh, okay, so uh, welcome everybody to another after night. I'm not sure exactly what number we're on now because I haven't been here for a while, but uh, I think it's in the mid 40s somewhere. And uh, I'm very happy to be here to introduce my friend, uh, Paul Schultz. Uh, almost very, very close to Dr. Paul Schultz. So Paul tells me he studies the mysteries of the cosmos, uh, by which he means pulsars, magnetars, fast radio bursts, which he's going to talk to you about tonight, and all sorts of other cool, often neutron star related things in the universe. Uh, and he's just submitted his thesis, which you'll be able to read online in the near future if you'd like to, uh, so that more than two people read it. And, uh, and he's going to be going to the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory in Penticton, British Columbia. Uh, later this month. So congratulations, Paul, and enjoy Paul's talk. Well, thanks, Eric, for that uh, great introduction. So I'm going to talk to you today about a recent uh, kind of discovery in astrophysics that uh, I've had the you know, fortune to be involved in in the early days. And uh, this new phenomenon is called fast radio bursts. So hopefully I will, you know, let you know what they are and what we think they could be, where they could be coming from. So what are fast radio bursts? So if I was to say in one sentence, one, you know, short sentence what they are, I would say fast radio bursts are bright millisecond long bursts of radio waves that appear to come from outside the Milky Way galaxy. So there's, you know, this is a short sentence, but there's a lot of content in this sentence. And I, the first part of my talk, I'll try to explain what the sentence means. So what it means for something to be a millisecond long, what it means for something to come from outside the Milky Way galaxy, what it means for something to be emitting radio waves. Uh, so fast radio bursts are a burst. I have a little example of one here. It, that's real data, yeah. So you see nothing for a little while, and then you see a little blip of uh, radio emission. This one's about five millisecond long. And uh, yeah, so they are radio waves. So what are radio waves? So you, so visible light is not the only light we see. We also see light that's shorter than visible light. That's high energy stuff like x-rays, gamma rays, the ultraviolet. We see things that are longer wavelength and lower energy than visible light, like microwave radiation, radio, uh, ra radio waves. And radio waves are light that is about you know, a good fraction of a meter to up to kilometers long. And uh, because this wavelength is so long and the radiation is 
uh, so low energy, you need to build pretty big telescopes to be able to see them. So this here is the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico. It is the largest uh, telescope in the world, or it's getting close to being beaten by a telescope in China. But uh, for a while, it's been the <laughs> largest in the world. And uh, it's a radio telescope that was featured in the movie Contact with Jodie Foster. <laughs> and she sits there with uh, headphones listening to the universe. Uh, I've never done that. I've never seen an astronomer do that. <laughs> Uh, what, uh, what we do is we slap uh, computers, instrumentation behind the telescope, record the data, and sit at our desks and analyze it. <laughs> so this here is a uh, instrument that we use to search or to, to characterize pulsars. So <laughs> pulsars are things that I work on, and I'll explain in a few slides what they are. But, uh, yeah. So what emits radio waves? So radio waves don't just come to your car radio and play songs for you. They also come from throughout the universe. Uh, basically anything that's emitting radiation at these low energies with very long wavelengths. And so here I have an example of a galaxy that's emitting radio waves. So the radio waves here are in pink. The other colors are optical light. And you can see that the radio traces out a structure that's not visible in the, in the optical. And this is a huge radio jet that's coming out of a galaxy. It's millions of light years across. Uh, and it has nothing to do with fast radio waves, but it's cool. It looks cool. <laughs> uh, another, uh, another picture with radio also in pink. Not sure why radio is always in pink, but apparently in these images it is. So this is a supernova, and what's left over after a supernova is some gas and dust. And here you can see that the pink traces out structures that you wouldn't be able to access if you were just looking with an optical telescope. Uh, also, the sun emits radio waves, and by extension, uh, stars in general emit them. <laughs> uh, so, lots of things in space emit radio waves. But, so, the things I've shown here have pretty pictures. Uh, unfortunately, fast radio bursts are just bursts, and they are like pulsars in some ways, and I'll get to why they're different. But, uh, anyways, I will introduce now pulsars, which are rotating neutron stars. And because they're only about 20 kilometers across, you can't make pretty images of them like in the past uh, couple slides because th you would just see one little point if you can actually see it in a radio image. But what we do see is when this pulsar is rotating, it's putting out a beam of light uh, at radio wavelengths that when it passes in front of the Earth, you see a little blip in your telescope and it does this once every rotation. Uh, so what are neutron stars? They're, uh, as ma the mass of the sun packed into about the size of the city, of a you know, city like Montreal, and it spins about as fast as a kitchen blender, or it can. This one that I showed here goes around about once per second. And it is, a, it is real data, and that's the speed of this real pulsar. Uh, anyways. Yeah, so the pulsars are, are extreme objects, and uh, yeah. so where do they come from? So when you have a large star that ends its life, uh, it's supported during its life by nuclear burning, and then that nuclear burning stops, and so the star starts to implode. And that pressure eventually, the core uh, is as compact as it can be, as compact as the atoms can be to each other, and then that causes an outward pressure, uh, w which is the core rebounding, that's what we call it in uh, astronomy. And that rebound gives you a gigantic explosion, one of the biggest explosions in the universe called the supernova. You've probably heard of that before. And what you're left over with is a neutron star. If 
you can be left over with a black hole if there's enough mass to collapse that uh, neutron star into a black hole. Anyways, uh, I've been talking about pulsars and maybe I'll, I've confused you while I've talked about them, but uh, I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> but uh, so fast radio bursts are a millisecond long. So what does that mean to be a millisecond long? Uh, so a short burst means you have a small source, like a neutron star. So nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So if something is one millisecond long, it means that the object that produced it had to be uh, smaller than one millisecond times the speed of light, which is 300 kilometers. Uh, and so you need something that's smaller than 300 kilometers to make such a burst. 20 kilometers is smaller than 300, so neutron stars work. Uh, you, need, you need objects that are fairly energetic. You can't just have an asteroid that can produce these huge bright bursts. And so really the only thing that we can think of are neutron stars and maybe something to do with black holes. The problem with black holes is that they're black. You can't get light out of a black hole. Definition of a black hole is that uh, it's smaller than the speed of light. Uh, the escape speed of is the, the escape speed is faster than the speed of light, and nothing can go faster than the speed of light. But there could be something weird going around a black hole. You could have something like a neutron star collapsing into a black hole, making these fast radio bursts. There's people who have theorized something like that. Uh, you could have uh, you know matter around the black hole, but uh, yeah, so maybe black holes, probably neutron stars. We'll see. Uh, so I've talked about pulsars. I've talked about fast radio bursts. Pulsars emit short pulses of radio waves, about a millisecond long. Fast radio bursts are millisecond long bursts of radio waves. So what's the difference? Why am I not just saying fast radio bursts are pulsars? Uh, I'll give a talk on pulsars now. No, th so there's a reason fast radio bursts are distinct from the pulsars that we know of. And that's the last part of the sentence, that they come from outside of the Milky Way. So all the radio pulsars that we know uh, live inside our Milky Way galaxy. If we took a pulsar that we know of in our galaxy, put it outside of our galaxy in you know, another distant galaxy, we wouldn't expect to see it, it just wouldn't be bright enough. But these fast radio bursts, we do see them coming from outside the galaxy. So that's the difference between the two. And also fast radio bursts have at least the first few years of their uh, life, and I'll get to that in a bit, are, uh, have been, were one-off events. They're just one-time things, you see one burst of you see one fast radio burst from the location on the sky, whereas pulsars, you see one burst every rotation. Okay, so what do I mean that they're outside of the Milky Way? Uh, in astronomy, we call that extragalactic, outside of our galaxy, extragalactic. So what does it mean for something to be extragalactic? So we live uh, basically at the sun. Uh, which is in a galaxy that's many hundreds of thousands of light years across compared to the solar system, which is much less than a light year. And so, you know, humanity has, the furthest we've been able to send something is, you know, much less than a light year. Uh, and the Milky Way itself is 100,000 times bigger than that at least. Uh, so the Milky Way contains billions of stars and, uh, the closest one to us is four light years. So that gives you a little sense of scale, and the scales get bigger. <laughs> so the closest galaxy of note to us, there are smaller galaxies, but uh, the closest to us, you know, that looks, that's similar in size to the Milky Way, is the Andromeda Galaxy. And uh, this actually is real data. Obviously, the Milky Way. We can't take a picture of it from outside because we live inside of it, but the Andromeda, we can take a pretty picture. I believe, I think this data, or actually I know this data is from the Galax satellite uh, in the ultraviolet. And uh, it looks kind of like a uh, 
one version of the Mac OS had a Galaxy, had Andromeda as a background, so it might look familiar to you for that reason. Anyways, Andromeda is two million light years away from the Milky Way, about you know 20 galaxy widths away from us, which is in universe scales, you know, right next door. It's really close to us. Uh, but there are many more galaxies uh, in the universe. So here I show a picture of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's uh, the deepest image that we've made of the of a patch of sky that humanity has made. Uh, actually, they might be up to like extra deep field or something now. They keep doing bigger versions of this or deeper versions of this, but. Uh, Anyways, it is one thirteen millionth of the total sky, which uh, probably doesn't mean much, but uh, if you take a grain of rice and hold it at arm's length, that's about the size of it on the sky. So it's a very small portion of the sky, and in that very tiny region of the sky it are you know over 10,000 galaxies. Every little point you see on this image down to you know the faintest to the, you know, the most small thing you can resolve is a galaxy. There are some stars, but those are the brighter things that have the uh, kind of speckle pattern around them. Anyways, the point of this is the universe contains ten, you know, th many thousands and thousands of galaxies, and for something to be extragalactic, it's coming from these huge scales outside of our galaxy, and there are many different environments that something could be coming from if it's out there. So I said that the Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across, about you know 20 galaxy widths away is Andromeda, and then throughout the universe there's billions, trillions of these galaxies, and uh, so the scale that fast radio bursts are coming from is about 100 million to 10 billion light years away. So you know about from about 50 times the distance of Andromeda away to, you know, a huge fraction, or to uh, the majority of the uh, size of the observable universe. Uh, okay, so why do we think they're coming from these very distant uh, scales? Uh, so just like when you take a prism and you shine light through it and white light divides into colors, uh, radio waves, being light, also kind of comes in colors. So uh, light is light. Light is made up of different frequencies, uh, and so the radio. We what we do is we see the burst at different radio frequencies, and because of uh, physics, I guess because of because of an effect where when radio radiation passes through plasma. It gets delayed at uh, at uh, at longer frequencies more than it does at shorter frequencies. We see this little sweep in our data, and so this is what we actually observe in our data. And what we do to get the burst is we correct for this sweep, and we collapse it to get a nice sharp little burst that's in this uh, the inset here. And uh, yeah, so here's an illustration by Eric Madsen, <laughs> uh, who I, I pilfered it from him. Uh, so a nice little cartoon where at the source you have a sharp burst and then it passes through this plasma and you get this effect that I'm talking about where the higher frequency uh, radiation gets delayed less than the lower frequency radiation. So the, the bluer radio light is delayed less than the redder radio light. And that's because of the amount of material between us and the source. And so because we can measure the amount of material between us and the source, because the sweep is proportional to the amount of plasma between us and the source, we can use that and models of the, ga of the, of the galaxy and the universe of how uh, material is distributed throughout the universe to, in, to infer how far away it is. And so that's why we think that they are extragalactic. And we're pretty confident in that. <laughs> in science, you always have doubts. So. <laughs> uh, 
uh, fast radio verse are bright. So this is the last part of the sentence that uh, I haven't explained, and I thought I would just compare it to things. So of course the first thing I compare it to is pulsars, because I work on pulsars, and you know the first thing we see when we see uh, pulses coming from space, we think, oh, is that a pulsar? Uh, and so the first thing we we would have compared it to when we detected the first FRB would have been pulsars. And they're about 10 trillion times brighter than your typical, uh, I said trillion, that's 10 quadrillion times brighter than your typical pulsar pulse. Actually, typical pulsar pulse from a bright pulsar. And I'm putting too many uh, adjectives together, but <laughs> the point is it's really bright. Uh, <laughs> and if we want to compare it to something more human, uh, or inhumane maybe, uh, uh, is a one meg megaton nuclear bomb, so you know, the most destructive thing we could make on Earth. Uh, it's a fast radio versus about 100, time trillion, 100 trillion times more uh, energetic than that. And if you want another little, I don't know, factoid, uh, they, in about one millisecond, an FRB puts out about as much radio radiation as the sun puts out in 300,000 years. Uh, basically, the point of this is that they are very energetic events. They are really bright. Okay, so I've explained what fast radio bursts are, and so now I'm gonna step back and give a little history of the field. It is a young field. The first FRB was discovered in 2007 which is less than 10 years ago. Uh, and initially when we saw it, the first question was, is it really coming from space? It's a one-off event. Nobody else has seen anything like this before. Maybe it's just a man-made signal that, mas that masquerades as something that looks like it's coming from space. That's showing this sweep due to the material between us and the source uh, that masquerades that uh, signal. So there was a lot of doubt at first, you know, especially when people kept looking and weren't really seeing anything, seeing anything else. But then in 2003, the detection of four more of these things were reported, uh, and they all looked convincingly astrophysical, convincingly, it, it was convincing that they're coming from space. And, uh, but, one thing was that they were all detected at the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. So people were saying, oh well, you know, maybe this is something that's generated, something man-made or even atmospheric that's coming from nearby the Parkes Radio Telescope that, uh, is, that makes it look like it's coming from space, but it's not actually. But then in 2014, uh, my collaborators and I reported on a discovery of another FRB that was seen at the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico, uh, where we were employing Jodie Foster to find fast radio. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, so that made things a lot more convincing because now you've seen this phenomenon at two different telescopes on Earth, they're in different environments, so, you know, it's, it's probably astrophysical. <laughs> so at this time, astronomers were pretty confident that they're coming from space. We're, we had 15 FRBs known uh, at different telescope. They were all one-off events. If you took your telescope, pointed it back at the location of where you saw the first, where you saw an FRB, looked for many hours, and people saw nothing. Uh, so because of this, many models that people were coming up with to explain fast radio bursts involved events where the source was destroyed. So you have something that emits a radio burst and then uh, that, ev that event causes the destruction of the object and you can't generate any more fast radio bursts. So things that people are throwing around are things like supernovae, gamma ray bursts, something weird around a black hole. But then in 2000, uh, in about a year ago, we were 
going through this exercise to look at the location of the FRB that we saw at Arecibo to see if we would see any more bursts from it. And we did. So this was a important step uh, in the discovery of FRB or in the you know, story of FRBs and you know, showing that whatever is generating at least this FRB survived the, uh, survived the event that caused the FRB. And so it's a discovery that I had the fortune of being the person to have the eureka moment and first see the, uh, the you know, be the first person to see the repeats. Uh, and so I'll th because of that, I'll uh, tell a little, tell, give you a little more detail on it. So Arecibo looked at the location of this FRB in about a year ago. Uh, then, probably somewhat boringly, uh, the t telescope data gets shipped off to a supercomputer here in Montreal called Gilliman, and this is because the, it's pretty computationally expensive to search these data for pulsars and for fast radio bursts. Uh, and so you do need quite a powerful computer to do it. Um, and then I was looking through the output of, you know, the, the results of this search of the data that we do on the supercomputer, and I saw this plot. And uh, a lot of technical information on it, but the point is I saw it and was like, okay, there's another burst from the same location in the sky as the first... Uh, Burst though in 2000 uh, that we discovered in 2014. So yes, FRBs can repeat. And so then we got down to work and uh, trying to convince ourselves that it's real. It's not a pulsar sitting in our galaxy. It is extra, actually extra galactic. And you know, several months of work later, we had a article ready for the journal Nature, and we put out an article. And about, well, and then a, a day after this article came out, the press started uh, going after it and writing articles. They only care, like, for one day after <laughs> this, the discovery. <laughs> but uh, on that day, they frantically write their uh, press on the discovery, and they write awesome headlines like aliens or rotating neutron stars. <laughs> um, Nowhere in that article does it say anything about aliens, but it is a catchy <laughs> title. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I hope by the end of this talk, you'll understand why it's more likely to be a rotating neutron star than aliens. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that was exciting. Uh, yeah, so now I've explained what fast radio bursts are. I've explained the little uh, you know, new exciting discovery that we've made in the past year that they can repeat. But based on this set of evidence that they're extra galactic, that they are a small object and that they're really bright, and that also they, at least some of them, can repeat, what do astronomers, what do we think they could be? What, uh, what, what phenomena could be causing these fast radio bursts? So basically, because they're bright, really far away, uh, you know, you have to invoke the most energetic things in astronomy. Uh, <laughs> uh, so things that go boom. Uh, the first obvious thing that goes boom is a supernova. So there are couple, in the, at least in the early days, there were a couple models suggesting supernovae. But of course, uh, a supernova is a one-off event where the star is destroyed uh, and you're left with a neutron star. But if the supernova event itself is what generates the fast radio burst, that neutron star can't have a supernova. <coughs> so that is a cataclysmic event. It destroys the source of the radio bursts, uh, and so it can't explain the repeater. But it could work if, you know, fast radio bursts could come from multiple sources. 
to say fast radioverse come from some things that repeat and some, some fast radioverse come from uh, cataclysmic events. It's uh, you know, too early in this field to start uh, drawing conclusions uh, yet. But, uh, then there are gamma ray bursts, which are thought to occur when two neutron stars merge together and collapse into a black hole. So maybe that's something that you could classify as weird things going around a black hole. I don't know. Depends on your definition of weird. Uh, anyways, a gamma ray burst, uh, when it happens, puts out this jet of gamma rays. So on the other end of the spectrum from radio waves, very, the, highest, uh, the highest energy wavelength of light, that, or the, the shortest wavelength, highest energy light that uh, exists in nature, it puts out this uh, burst. This, this jet generates a burst that we see uh, with gamma ray telescopes. So you could you could think of okay, maybe there's a also a radio burst that goes along with this uh, gamma ray burst. But again, it's cataclysmic. It can't explain the repeating uh, fast radio burst. But it could work if there's multiple explanations. Uh, okay, so I keep crossing these guys out, or at least caveating them with uh, the fact that they're cataclysmic. But, so maybe I should provide an explanation that could repeat. So other big explosions in the universe uh, occur from magnetars. So what magnetars are, are, nu are, pulse are neutron stars that have high magnetic fields, uh, magnetic fields that are unusually high for a neutron star. Uh, many, so many trillions of uh, times larger than, uh, than, you know, the magnetic field of the Earth or the magnetic field of the Sun. And so because of this large energy reservoir that you have stored in the magnetic field, you can cause large explosions on magnetars. And one way that they think uh, you could create them is by cracking the crust by the, the magnetic field uh, causing cracks in the crust, and they call these star quakes, which is a cool word. Uh, yeah. So anyways, uh, they're known to emit bright bursts and x-rays, and so you could, you know, theorists have come up with uh, explanations that perhaps these, when you generate an x-ray burst, you also generate a radio burst. Uh, so, and that because the explosion happens on the surface of the magnetar and doesn't explode the star, it could repeat. And now the last, the other repeating phenomena brings us back to pulsars. So fast radio bursts are bursts, are, are short millisecond long bursts and pulsars put out short uh, millisecond bursts every time they rotate. So the problem that I, mentioned earlier is that the pulsars that we know in our galaxy are just way too faint to, uh, to be FRBs. But we do know of an example of a pulsar in our galaxy called the Crab Pulsar, which lives in the Crab Nebula. Uh, this painting looking picture is actually a real image from uh, the Hubble telescope in the optical and the Chandra telescope in the X-ray. And in the middle of the nebula, you can see a uh, bright source, and, a, and that's the Crab Pulsar, and it's causing, because it's an energetic neutron star, it's causing all these particles to flow out from it, and it has this nice uh, nebula called a Pulsar Wind Nebula around it. Uh, anyways, uh, the point is that the crab emits something called supergiant pulses. So these are pulses that are about a hundred uh, million times brighter than the typical pulse from your uh, garden variety pulsar. It's still a hundred thousand times fainter than what we see from FRBs, but uh, the universe is a big place, right? So you have a phenomenon that's rare in our galaxy that we see coming from one pulsar in our galaxy. But then if you go out to all these billions of other galaxies that FRBs could be coming from, an event that's rare in our galaxy is quite common 
when you take into account that there's billions of them in the universe, right? Uh, so maybe you, uh, a more energetic version of these pulses that we see in the crab pulsar could be generating uh, fast radio bursts. So I've decided to double the super and call them super, super giant pulses. <laughs> Not an official scientific term, but... Uh, Yeah, so what's next? We know, so we have all these possible explanations for fast radio bursts. How are we gonna unravel this? How are we gonna figure out what's actually generating fast radio bursts? Which of these explanations works? Whether they're all wrong, we have to throw them all out and go back to the drawing board. So what do we have to do? So one, we have to figure out what galaxies are coming from. When we detect a radio burst, coming from space in our radio telescope, we can't, we, the amount of sky that we see at a time is too much and there are many galaxies in that, in that region that we think the fast radio burst is coming from. So we need to try to pinpoint which galaxy it's coming from and that'll let us know, you know, is that galaxy the typical, the typical type of galaxy that has a crab, a crab pulsar like pulsar in it? Or is it a galaxy that is typical of generating uh, gamma ray bursts from merging neutron stars? Uh, we need to build up statistics if uh, we detect, so so far we've detected about 20 fast radio bursts. If we can detect many thousands of them, we can tell, do, like, do half of them repeat? Do they all repeat? Do half of them, are, are a portion of them much brighter than another portion of them, so hints that there are multiple uh, populations within fast radio bursts. And also, we should look in other wavelengths, in the, in the visible wavelengths at high energy in the X-ray and gamma ray, to see does uh, fast radio bursts, do they occur at the same time as these other phenomena uh, in astronomy? Uh, and to do that, you need to detect a lot of fast radio bursts. You need a sensitive radio telescope that can see a lot of sky. And thankfully, we're building one of these in Canada. So uh, this is the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, a, an acronym that really doesn't matter for the FRB experiment because we're not mapping hydrogen, the, the intensity of hydrogen in the universe. So I won't explain what that is, but the point is we're going to use this telescope that's being built to map the hydrogen throughout the universe. Uh, we are going to place a computer next to it, I, be I believe to the left of it, in a, in a sea can, so a, a shipping container. So it's a nice little compact hut that you can put computers in. <laughs> and. Uh, we will, we will take a copy of the data from, the, from the, the hydrogen intensity mapping experiment and search it for FRBs. And we'll be able to do this all the time. So we'll just be continuously uh, taking data from the telescope and searching it for FRBs. Uh, and Eric mentioned that uh, I will be, Eric's not there anymore. Uh, that I will be moving to the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory in Penticton, BC in, I guess, uh, very soon. <laughs> and I'll be starting a job there where I'll be working on this, uh, the fast radio burst uh, searching experiment using CHIME. Uh, and uh, so, what is the power of CHIME? Again, something that I stole from Eric. Uh, so because CHIME is a, is a cylinder instead of a dish, so most radio telescopes are dishes and they see a small, uh, the field of view that they have is, is quite small on the sky. For example, uh, the Arecibo telescope, the largest radio telescope in the world, uh, sees about a trillionth of the sky at once. Whereas if you have a cylinder, you see a strip on the sky. And if you have four cylinders, you see four strips on the sky. But then if you put a whole bunch of receivers along the cylinder, basically cameras along the cylinder that are sensitive to radio 
radiation, uh, you can pixelate those strips using, uh, using software on big computers, basically. <laughs> Big computers help a lot in astronomy. And so we will be able to see a large chunk of the sky at once. Instead of a trillionth of the sky, we'll see you know, basically this uh, strip on the sky. And as, as the uh, Earth rotates, the sky will move above those cylinders. The cylinders have no moving parts in them. And the sky will just rotate above the telescope. And so every day, we will sample the sky above Penticton uh, once per day for fast radio bursts. And because of that, we will see uh, one FRB, okay, I, I shouldn't say we will see. Uh, we predict that we will see <laughs> one FRB per 10 minutes to 10 hours. Compare this to the large uh, single dishes where get one FRB per 100 hours to 1,000 hours of observing. Uh, that's an important that it's 100 to 1,000 years, or not years, hours of observing. Uh, so if you are, if the telescope is not, you know, actively searching for FRBs, you're not going to be able to see anything. So one distinction that's important between the two is that CHIME is an experiment. It has dedicated, uh, dedicated instrumentation behind it to search for FRBs 100% of the time. These radio telescopes are observatories. People propose to the observatory and say, hey, I want to do this exciting thing right now. Let me have some time to do it. And part of that time is for searching for FRBs, but it's only part of the telescope's time. So, you know, even though there are more than a thousand hours in a year. Uh, it's you know you might only get a thousand years on the tel a thousand hours on the telescope in a year to look for FRBs and only find you know a order one per year, whereas Chime will be able to look uh, one per you know find several per day. So hopefully I've convinced you that. Uh, Fast radio universe are interesting. I find them interesting. Uh, but also, importantly, I hope I've explained to you what they are and that you appreciate that we don't know where they're coming from. Uh, we have some ideas, but it's an open question where they're coming from. And hopefully, Chime will help answer that question. Any questions? <laughs> Let's see. How about start there? Uh, so, would it be possible they're coming from two galaxies merging together? Uh, no. So, what you need is something that's about you know less than 300 kilometers across, whereas galaxies are many hundreds of thousands of light years across, uh, and a light year being. Uh, 300,000 kilometers, right? Where am I off by? 300,000 meters, right? Uh, <laughs> in, in, in astronomy, we set, uh, we set the speed of light to one. Uh, yeah, so they, so the reason we call them fast radio versus because yes, we detect them in the radio, but yeah, it's potential that it, we, these could be coming from events that we do see in other wavelengths, like if they're coming from gamma ray bursts or supernovae. So it's, you know, it, it is possible that we've already seen them at other wavelengths. We just haven't connected these two phenomena. But uh, what, at least what makes them Uh, 
yes, it would rule out uh, many phenomena that predict that you would get them, that you would get counterparts at other uh, energies, you know, in the visible or X-ray. Yeah. So that's too, too early. Yeah. So for example, pulsars, if this is an extragalactic pulsar just emitting radio waves, we wouldn't expect to see it at any other wavelength. If it was a magnetar bursting, yeah, we might expect to see X-ray bursts as well along with it. If it's a supernova, we'd expect to see a bright optical supernova. So definitely if we follow up uh, using other telescopes in the optical and X-ray and don't see anything else, it definitely tells us something. Uh, so probably, well, I guess we don't know. Yeah, so our galaxy is one galaxy in a universe full of billions of galaxies. If you have a rare event that occurs, you know, once per galaxy per, say, millennia, then if you have a thousand galaxies, if you're looking at a thousand galaxies, you're going to see, you know, uh, one a year, right? So it's because when you have all of these, ga when you have a whole bunch of galaxies, an event that's rare becomes quite common throughout the universe. Yeah, so I don't know the I don't know those numbers offhand. So I can't. Yeah, it's it's a uh, very sensitive. You know, we do the best we can, right? <laughs> Try to have, get the lowest noise uh, as deep as we can. Yeah. Uh, sure. How about there? Could they be wormholes? Could they be wormholes? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> is a wormhole smaller than 300 kilometers? <laughs> I guess. Yeah, so I guess that's what the theory of a wormhole are, but we don't, we haven't seen any, you know, in the universe yet, so we don't know that they actually exist. Uh, so I guess, uh, you know, a black hole is small enough to generate this. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it, it, it's both. So part of it is that we have this dedicated experiment we'll, where we will be able to search 24 hours a day. But actually the bigger, uh, the bigger boon to it is uh, technology. So uh, let's go back to Chime. So in order to, to take those cylindri to take the strip on the sky and pixelate it into uh, a bunch of pixels, you do need uh, powerful computers to, uh, to do that uh, calculation. Uh, and so it is computing power is a, one big uh, thing that allows us to do this. Yeah, so what we, what we were looking for were pulsars. So just the pulsars in our galaxy uh, and that's why people, when the first one was detected, was 
they were, you know, skeptical. We weren't looking for them. We just see this bright burst that we don't know where it's coming from. Too bright to be a pulsar. Uh, maybe it's just a man-made signal. Right? So, but then things got more convincing as we started to find more of them. Right? Uh, yeah. Yes, potentially. Uh, if it's if it's coming from a gamma ray burst, uh, you know, we we wouldn't if a gamma ray burst happened in our galaxy. And well, okay, one thing that's nice about gamma ray bursts is they uh, they they put out this narrow beam, so it could happen in our galaxy, and then it just doesn't point directly at us, and so that wouldn't uh, hurt us too much. But uh, if you're unlucky, uh, yeah, we, we, depending on the phenomena, we might be happy that they're not happening in our galaxy. <laughs> uh, sure. But. So we assume that it's, uh, you know, emitted isotropically. Uh, we don't take into account any beaming. Uh, if something is happening, something is beamed, then it's even higher. Uh, yeah, so when we saw the repeating FRB, we searched for this, and we couldn't see, we couldn't find any common periodicity between the bursts. So if it was a pulsar, you would expect uh, them to be coming regularly at a certain period, right? And we don't see that, so there's something a bit weirder going on here if it is a pulsar. Uh, yeah, so I guess I can use the example of a gamma ray burst again. So a gamma ray burst is two neutron stars merging, and that's something that's supposed to uh, generate a signal uh, that will be detected by um, experiments like uh, LIGO that you may have heard of, so gravitational wave observatories. So it's possible that we could correlate the time of fast radio bursts with uh, gravitational wave events, and if they uh, come at the same time, that would be a, a very you know, important clue in figuring out what they are. Uh, sure. So you were saying that you were able to detect the SRBs uh, reproducing, right? Is that right? Yeah. How confident are you that they're actually coming in close? Uh, uh, very confident. So not only are they coming from the same part of the sky, but I mentioned that we can infer how far away it is uh, based on the amount of material between us and the source. And that's the same from burst to burst to very accurate precision. So it's definitely coming from the same uh, distance and location on the sky. Uh, how about What's the next question? Uh, <laughs> well, I guess I'm not sure I'm still, you know, hung up on these questions. <laughs> <laughs> this, the, the, the second question, uh, you know, could potentially take a, could take a large fraction of my career to figure out. <laughs> 
So if we go back to gamma ray bursts, it, it, took, it took many decades to figure out that gamma ray bursts were, that, that some gamma ray bursts were merging neutron stars. And that's still, there are, there are skeptics of that too, so there's still open questions with that. So, uh, one simple question can be very uh, complicated. Thanks for listening. <laughs>
if you uh, still have questions, Paul's going to be hanging out uh, down front here for a little bit, um, so you can come and talk to him. Again, the telescopes, if you would like to go see Saturn through a telescope, which is awesome, you should go out the door, take the telescope all the way down to the ground floor, go out the doors to the little grassy area. If you like these talks, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook, check out our YouTube page where we have recordings of past lectures and we are uploading our podcast that we record with um, visiting uh, scientists, including the latest one about fast radio bursts. So thanks everyone. <laughs>